This is a Relay Project. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. Are you addicted to your phone? Are you addicted to technology? Does your tablet, your laptop, whatever device it is, have you in an absolute stranglehold? We don't like these types of questions, do we? We get uncomfortable when family and friends call us out for having our faces buried in our phones. In this episode of The Best of Real Talk, we take this on head on with Johan Hari, author of Stolen Focus. You know, tens of millions of people have looked to his TED Talks for insight into what's been taken from us and how we can take it back. That's coming up in just a second. This episode of The Best of Real Talk is presented by We Know Training. You can find them online at weknowtraining.ca. Get ready to hit the training jackpot. We Know Training partners with associations across North America to create, host, and deliver online training, continuing education, professional development, and credentialing programs. Their top-notch LMS software lets associations and regulators Regulators monetize their training programs, creating new revenue streams and opportunities to support operations, fund new initiatives, and of course, invest in creating more awesome training programs. But wait, there's more. Association members can join in on the fun by enhancing their skills, staying up to date with the latest professional development trends, and becoming experts in their fields. Association leaders, don't miss out on this exciting opportunity. Contact partnerships at weknowtraining.ca today to learn more. Our next guest is a New York Times best-selling author three times over. The executive producer of an Oscar-nominated movie in an eight-part TV series, He's written over the past decades for some of the world's leading newspapers and magazines, including the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, The Guardian, The Spectator, Politico. You may have seen him on HBO's Real Time with Bill Maher, on the podcast with Joe Rogan, on the BBC's Question Time. His TED Talks have been viewed nearly 100 million times. His new book, Stolen Focus, Why You Can't Pay Attention and How to Think Deeply Again. What a pleasure to welcome Johan Hari to the program. Thank you for making time for us. And, and greetings oh. from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, all the way over to London. Oh, cheers, Ryan. It's lovely to be with you again. Yeah, I know a lot of people are oh. excited. Uh, uh, your upcoming visit uh, to Alberta's capital city, and we're going to be getting into the pages of, of your book, Stolen Focus. We're talking about addiction here, and, and, and I'm, I'm hoping to use some of this time to pick your brain on things like the opioid crisis. You've been fascinated with the human condition and, and our proclivity to become addicted, including to devices, to our phones. It was an experience circling around Graceland, it sounds like, that prompted you writing this book. How did this all get started? <laughs> yeah, I've got a godson, and when he turned nine, He developed this brief but very intense obsession with Elvis Presley, and it was super cute because he seemed to genuinely not know that impersonating Elvis had become a kind of cheesy cliche. So I think he was the last person in the history of the world to do an entirely sincere version of Jailhouse Rock. But um, when I used to tuck him into bed at night, he used to get me to tell him the story of Elvis's life over and over again. Obviously, I skipped over the bit at the end where he died on the toilet. And, And one night I mentioned Graceland where Elvis lived, and I mentioned that people go and visit it and his whole face lit up. And he said, Johan, will you take me to Graceland one day? And I was like, sure. The way you do with nine-year-olds knowing, you know, next week you'll want to go to Lapland or Legoland or whatever. And he said, no, do you really swear one day you will take me to Graceland? And I said, I absolutely promise. And I didn't think of that moment again for 10 years until so many things had gone wrong. Um, when he was 15, he dropped out of school. And by the time he was 19, he spent literally all his waking hours almost alternating between his iPad, his iPhone and his laptop. And his life was just this blur of WhatsApp, YouTube, porn. And it it felt like he was almost kind of whirring at the speed of Snapchat. You know what I mean? Where nothing still or serious could touch him. And one day we were sitting on my sofa, just almost literally where I'm sitting now, just behind it. And 
all day I was trying to get a conversation going with him and I just couldn't. And he's a very intelligent and likable person. And to be totally honest with you, Ryan, I wasn't that much better. I was staring at my own devices. And I suddenly remembered this moment all these years before. And I said to him, hey, this is no way to live. Let's go to Graceland. And he looked at me totally blankly. He's like, what are you talking about? And I reminded him. And I said, look, we've got to break this numbing routine. Let's go on a road trip all over the South. But I suddenly thought ahead. I said, you've got to promise me one thing, which is that if we go, you'll leave your phone in the hotel during the day because there's no point going if you're just going to stare at a screen the whole time. And he took a beat and he really thought about it. He said, you know what? I want to do this. And I think it was literally two, two weeks, three weeks later, we took off here from here in London to New Orleans where we went first. And a couple of weeks after that, we got to the gates of Graceland. And when you get to Graceland now, this is even, we were going there before COVID. There's no person to show you around. What happens is they, they hand you an iPad and you put in earbuds and the iPad shows you around. It says, go left, go right. Every room you go in, there's an image of that, that room on the iPad in front of you. And it tells you a story about that room. So we start walking around Graceland and there's this kind of weird effect that I'm becoming aware of, which is that no one's actually looking at Graceland. Everyone's just kind of staring at the screen. And then every now and then people look away from the screen and I'm like, oh, but they look away from the screen to take out their phones, take a selfie, put their phone away, go back to looking at the screen. So I'm getting a bit, a little bit tense and we got to the jungle room that was elvis's favorite room in graceland it's full of fake plants and i'll never forget them there was a canadian couple no disrespect to all canadians listening uh, it was a canadian couple next to us who were maybe in their early 50s and the man turned to his wife and he said honey this is amazing look if you swipe left you can see the jungle room to the left and if you swipe right you can see the jungle room to the right and i laughed out loud because i thought they were kidding and I turned and watched them and they were just swiping back and forth. And I I leaned over and I said, but hey, sir, there's um, a kind of old fashioned form of swiping you could do. It's called turning your head. Yeah. Because you realize we're in the jungle room. You don't have to look at it on the internet. It's it's literally all around you. And they looked at me like I was insane and 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 backed out the room. And I turned to my godson to laugh about it. And he was standing in the corner staring at Snapchat because from the moment we landed, he just couldn't stop. He he literally couldn't stop. And I went up to him. I did that thing that's never a good idea with teenagers. I tried to grab the phone out of his hand. And I said, look, I know you're afraid of missing out. But this is guaranteeing that you'll miss out. You're not present at the events of your own existence. You're not showing up at your own life. And he stormed off understandably. And I walked around Memphis on my own that day. And I found him that night at the Heartbreak Hotel up the street where we were staying. And um, he was sitting, his feet were in this giant guitar shirt swing pool and he was looking at Snapchat. And I went up to him and I apologized for getting so angry. And he said, um, I know something's really wrong and I don't know what it is. And that's when I realized, oh, we came away to get away from this problem of distraction but there was nowhere to escape to because it's everywhere. It's the air we breathe. And that's when I thought, okay, I need to figure out what's happening to our attention. Is it really getting worse? Um, and if it is, what's causing this? And that was really the journey that led me to write Stolen Focus. The, the book is that journey. So you you swear off tech basically as the story goes and you write about it in the book. People need to read the book. They need to check it out. But you swear off all tech basically for three months, right? You're in Massachusetts. You, you go, I, mean, I love you telling the story of like you're you're going into, what is it, Target or somewhere and you're, you're trying to find like basically the lousiest phone that you can. You don't <laughs> want access to your email. You don't need apps. You don't need it to be able to run the internet. And you start to participate in the exercise. I mean, just even anecdotally, I'll let people know in promoting your interview here. We go to tag you on Twitter. We can't right now because you're you're Twitter. You're signed on a Twitter. You're off Twitter. You're 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 on and off your social media platforms. What was that three months like for you? The the first few days must have been maybe a little bit twitchy. You're probably you know by by habit going to check your phone or whatever as you eased into week one, week two, week three. What did you start learning about yourself? You know, it's interesting because at the start of the book, right, I had felt that my own ability to focus was getting worse, right? Each year that passed, things that require deep focus that are really important to me, like reading books, having proper long conversations, even watching movies were getting 
harder and harder. And I could see this was happening to huge numbers of people around me, right? The the average office worker now focuses on any one task for less than one minute. And for every one child who was identified with serious attention problems when I was seven years old, there's now a hundred children who've been identified with that problem. So I was thinking about this and I kind of thought at the start of the book, wrongly, it turned out, I thought I knew what the problem was. I thought, well, the problem here is obvious. There's two things going on. Um, I'm weak. There's something wrong with me. I'm not strong enough to resist this stuff. And someone invented the smartphone and that screwed me over. So if the problem was me having a lack of willpower in the existence of the smartphone. It seemed to me the answer was obvious, which is use your willpower and separate yourself from the smartphone. So I went to a place called Provincetown in Cape Cod for three months where I had no smartphone and no laptop that could get onto the internet. And I did not look at the internet for three months. And there were lots of ups and downs in those three months. Um, but the thing that most amazed me was how much my attention came back, right? Because the other thing I thought is, you know, I was nearly 40. I thought maybe my attention is getting worse because I'm getting older. My attention went back to being as good as it had been when I was 17. I was stunned. But then we got to the end of the three months and I thought, well, this has been this weird little uh, break from reality. But I never want to go back to the way I was. I'm going to be really strict with myself. And within a few weeks of getting back, I was almost as bad as I'd ever been. And I felt a real sense of despair. And that's when I thought, okay, I need to really understand what's going on here. So I ended up going on this big journey all over the world from Moscow to Miami to Melbourne, not just to cities that begin with the letter M. I don't know why I keep doing ah. that. Um, and I interviewed over 200 of the leading experts on attention and focus um, and used my training in the social sciences at Cambridge University to really dig deeply into their, their findings. And what I learned is there's actually scientific evidence for 12 factors that can make your attention better or make your attention worse. Some of them are in our technology. Actually, they go very widely. A lot of them are things I'd never even thought about. The food we eat is really negatively affecting our attention and focus. The way our offices work is really harming our attention and focus. The way our kids' schools work is really harming their attention and focus. And there's a really broad range of these 12 factors. But crucially, when you understand what these 12 factors are, first of all, you begin to realize it's not a problem with you, right? You're not weak. You're not a failure. There's nothing wrong with you. Your kid is not weak and a failure. There's nothing wrong with your child. There's something wrong with the way we're living. Uh, your attention did not collapse. The book is called Stolen Focus because your attention has been stolen from you by some really big and powerful forces. But once you understand what those forces are, you can begin to protect yourself and your kids to some degree. And together as a society, we can begin to take those forces on. Uh, you, you talk uh, as part of this exercise to James Williams, a former Google strategist who makes a good point to you talking about how the digital detox, the one that even you are participating in, isn't the solution uh, long term in so many ways is, you know, wearing a gas mask outside isn't a long term solution uh, to air pollution. When we talk yeah. about this, I mean, I, I was describing to a friend last night talking about this interview and, and telling him he had to make sure that he checked it out. I, I, I described it essentially as your wake up call that that really on a way society's on a road to ruin and and i don't actually think that that's me being sensational in the context of your book i mean what's worst case scenario here as you see it well i would say to everyone listening think about anything you've ever achieved in your life that you're proud of whether it's starting a business being a good parent learning to play the guitar whatever it is that thing that you're proud of required a huge amount of sustained focus and attention. And when your ability to focus and pay attention deteriorates, as, as it is happening to almost all of us, your ability to achieve your goals deteriorates, your ability to solve your problems deteriorates. You feel worse about yourself because you actually are less competent. And when you start to get your attention back in these very focused, scientifically driven ways that I write about in the book, it's like regaining your superpower. So I think what you're asking is a really important question about what's the worst case scenario. Um, the worst case scenario, I think is if you think about the anxieties, every, think about what I felt about my godson. The reason I was so worried about his inability to pay attention is because it's very obvious when you see a child who can't pay attention, that they're going to really struggle to achieve their goals in life, right? Because depth and focus are at the core of almost all achievement. Um, and that's bad enough when applied to one child. But when it's applied to a wider society, you know, 
You mentioned Dr. James Williams, a brilliant person who'd worked at the heart of Silicon Valley. I interviewed lots of people who worked at the heart of Silicon Valley. I think it was most striking is how guilty they feel about what they've done. But Dr. Williams has this very interesting way of talking about it. He says there's three kinds of attention. I actually think there's a fourth one, which I know he agrees with. The first layer of attention is the one we think about most when we think about attention problems. It's what's called your spotlight. So anyone listening, unless you're sitting in a completely darkened room, there's loads of stuff around you, right? Like while I'm sitting talking to you, but if I turn my head slightly, I can see out the window, I can see the street, I can see people walking around. I could turn my head to the left and see my books. I could, uh, I've hidden it, but I can look at my phone. Yeah, you know, but I'm screening out all of that and I'm focusing on you. What did Ryan just ask me? So it's called your spotlight because you narrow down to one task. And we can all feel that our spotlight is being disrupted. You know, if I go to the fridge to get a Diet Coke and my friend texts me, and I start responding and then I'm standing in the middle of the kitchen. I'm like, why the hell did I come here? Right. And I come back and I don't have my Diet Coke. That's a disruption to your spotlight. But the next, le- but that's the thing we think about most and it's causing lots of problems for us. And we can talk about how to deal with that. Uh, and there are definitely ways to stop that happening. The next level up is, is what he calls your starlight, which is not your ability to achieve an immediate goal, like going to the fridge. It's your ability to achieve a long-term goal. I want to set up a business. I want to be a good parent. I want to write a book, whatever it might be. It's called your starlight because when you're lost in the desert, you look to the stars to figure out where you're going. The next level up, and he argues that's being disrupted. I think clearly it is. The next level up is what he calls your daylight. And that's not your ability to achieve a long-term goal. That's your ability to even figure out what your long-term goals are. How do you know what business you want to set up? How do you know what book you want to write? How do you know what it means to be a good parent? Mm. To know those things, you have to have lots of time to think. You have to be able to rest. You have to let your mind wander. You have to sleep well. Um, We're being deprived of those things. The next level up, and I think this goes to the worst case scenario most acutely, is what I would call our stadium lights, which is not just our ability to achieve our own goals, but our ability as a society to achieve collective goals. It is not a coincidence that all over the world, in countries as different as Britain, Brazil, and Burma, we're experiencing enormous crises in listening to each other and in democracy at the same time as this attention crisis. Democracy is a form of attention, right? We can't listen to each other. We spend our time screaming at each other. We are unable to see each other clearly. So I think the worst case scenario is if we don't solve the attention crisis, we're going to suffer, our kids are going to suffer, but actually our democracies are going to come apart at the seams. And you don't need to imagine that because you are in fact seeing it. We were we were talking with a former Canadian diplomat, former you know federal cabinet minister, just before we talked to you. And, and this was coming up. I mean, it's a, it's a hot topic in Canada right now. Chinese interference and in Canada's democracy, uh, you know, allegedly over the past two elections and, and maybe more than that. And talk of, of Huawei on the on the 5G network and sure. talk of TikTok. I mean, all these things. Your, your book sounds alarm after alarm i mean wake up calls on things that we know about i mean when you when you talk about infinite scrolling for example um now i was talking to my buddy chris a, f- a friend of mine your book really resonated with him he's who put you on my radar and he's really excited oh. about this this mental health foundation's fundraising breakfast we'll talk about in a minute you're coming to to edmonton to deliver the keynote coming up on march 15th people can check out mentalhealthfoundation.ca for more on that but we were talking about that concept of infinite scrolling and, and, and realizing that back in the day, you remember you'd be on Facebook or whatever on your timeline, you'd get to the bottom and then you'd click like show more or next page. It's not the case anymore. It doesn't happen on Instagram. You can scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll. And we're learning more about the YouTube algorithms and, and how to have our show accessible or in front of more people and, and to do what you can to make that happen. But the more you learn about it, the more you get into the belly of the beast, I mean, it's really actually quite concerning. You, you you talk about turning hate into a habit, for example, and how people can be manipulated and, and how people ultimately can be radicalized. I don't want to say unknowingly to absolve people of personal responsibility, but but in a way, people don't even realize what's happening to them right in front of them. I think you put that really well, Ryan. And I think this is why it's so important for people to understand for all of the 12 factors harming our attention that I write about in Stolen Focus I think there are two levels at which we've got to respond to them. I think of them as defense and offense. 
there are loads of things that we can do as individuals immediately to defend ourselves and our children against these forces that are so harming our attention. I'll give you an example of one. I should have brought it over to the camera. Over there, I've got something called a K safe. It's very simple. I feel a bit like a QVC person now, but it's a plastic safe. You take off the lid, you put in your phone, you put on the lid, you turn the dial, push the button, and it will lock your phone away for anything between five minutes and a whole day. I use that for three hours a day to clear my head to write. I won't, have my, I won't sit down and watch a film with my partner unless we both put our phones in the phone gel. We'll have my friends around for dinner unless everyone imprisons their phone. I recommend anyone with kids at least have an hour a day when everyone imprisons their phone and you have to actually look into each other's eyes, right? So there are dozens of things like that that I write about in the book where we can take personal responsibility, as you say, and begin to protect ourselves. And I'm passionately in favour of these individual changes. I also want to be really honest with people because I do not feel most books about attention are being honest with people. Mm -hmm. These individual changes are hugely important. I beg you to do them. On their own, they're not going to fully solve the problem. Because at the moment, it's like someone is pouring itching powder over us all day and then leaning forward and going, hey, buddy, you should learn to meditate. Then you wouldn't be scratching all the time. You want to go, screw you. I'll learn to meditate. That is very valuable. But you need to stop pouring this itching powder on me. Our attention is not collapsing because you failed to have good habits. Our attention is collapsing because huge invasive forces are designed to hack our attention. Now, that sounded to me kooky and conspiratorial until I spent a lot of time with people who worked in the food industry, people who worked in Silicon Valley going down the list of the 12 causes. Um, you see it in so many of these factors. So, for example, you mentioned social media, infinite scroll. It's very simple. And people who had designed this kept explaining to me and I kept saying to them, it can't be this simple. And they said, how do you think it works? Anyone watching, anyone listening, if, if you open TikTok, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram now, they begin to make money out of you immediately in two ways. The first way is really obvious. You see advertising. Okay, no one needs me to explain that. The second way is much more important. Everything you ever do on these apps is scanned and sorted by their artificial intelligence algorithms to figure out what you like and what makes you tick. And they have a huge amount of information on you, including from your so-called private messages. And they are building up a complex, detailed profile of who you are. And they're doing that really for one reason, to figure out what will keep you scrolling, what to feed you to keep you scrolling. Because every time you pick up the app and begin to scroll, they begin to make money. And every time you close the app, that revenue stream disappears. So all of this genius in Silicon Valley, all this AI, all these algorithms is geared towards one thing and one thing only, figuring out how do we get you to open the app as often as possible and scroll as long as possible. That's it. Just like the head of KFC, all he cares about is how often did you go to KFC this week and how big was the bucket you bought? Mm. All they care about is how often, how often did you open the app and how long did you scroll? But the crucial thing to understand is, and it took me a long time to absorb this, social media doesn't have to work that way. We can have all the social media we currently have and have it designed not to hack our attention, but to heal our attention. And there's a historical analogy that really helped me to understand this that you'll remember, I remember, most of your listeners will remember. So when we were kids, I think we're probably about the same age, Ryan, I'm 44. Yeah. When we were kids, the gasoline that you bought in Canada, in Britain, all over the world was leaded gasoline, right? And it was discovered by scientists that exposure to lead is really bad for your brain and in particular bad for children's ability to focus and pay attention. So what happened was, and of course, if it's in gasoline, it was in the air, everyone was breathing in lead, very high levels of lead. So what happened was a group of ordinary women, mothers, at the time they called themselves housewives, banded together and said, why are we allowing this? Why are we allowing these companies to screw up our kids' brains? And it's important to notice what they didn't say. They didn't say, so let's get rid of gasoline and ban cars, right? Just like none of us are saying, let's get rid of tech and all join the Amish. Right? That's not the answer, right? What they said was, let's get rid of the specific kind of gasoline that harms our kids and move to a form of gasoline that doesn't harm them. And people will remember this campaign, right? And how did it go? It followed the classic pattern of all successful political movements. First, they ignored them. Then they laughed at them. Then they fought them. Then they won. As everyone listening knows, 
There's no more leaded gasoline almost anywhere in the world. As a result, the Center for Disease Control has calculated the average Canadian child is three to five IQ points higher than they would have been had we not banned leaded gasoline, right? Now, to me, that's a great model for thinking about so many of the 12 factors that are harming our attention in stolen focus. Of course, we should take personal responsibility and protect ourselves and our kids as much as we can. But we should also take personal responsibility by banding together with everyone else and dealing with the forces that are doing this. So we've got to regulate big tech to name one of the 12 causes that I write about in, in the book. They're not going to do this themselves any more than the lead industry was going to ever go, guys, I think we've made enough money. Let's <laughs> stop screwing up kids' brains. It's not how it works, right? They had to be made to do it. We can make these social media companies do that. And, you know, you mentioned Dr. Williams before, who'd been at the heart of the machine. I'll never forget him saying to me, you know, the axe existed. Human beings had the axe for 1.4 million years before any human being said, guys, shall we put a handle on this thing? The entire internet has existed for less than 10,000 days. We can put this stuff right if we want to. But the key thing is it requires a shift in psychology. We need to absolutely make individual changes. And a lot of my book is about that. But we also need to realize, you know, we are not medieval peasants begging at the court of King Zuckerberg for a few little crumbs of attention from his table, right? We are the free citizens of democracies and we own our own minds and we can take them back if we want to by taking on the forces that are stealing our attention. But you don't get what you don't fight for. Of course, I mean, peacefully fight for. You don't get what you don't fight for. We've got to make a choice about this. At the moment, the way I think of it is we're in a race. You've got these 12 factors that are harming and invading our attention. And many of them are poised to become more powerful. You know, Paul Graham, one of the biggest investors in Silicon Valley, said that the world is on course to be more addictive in the next 40 years than it was in the last 40. Think about how much more addictive TikTok, which you mentioned is, than Facebook. Right now, imagine the next crack-like iteration of TikTok in the metaverse. That's one side of the race. On the other side of the race, there's got to be a movement of all of us saying, no, no, you don't get to do that to me. You don't get to do that to my brain. You don't get to do that to my children. No, that is not a good life. Of course, we choose a life with plenty of technology, but we choose a life where we can think deeply, where we can read books, where our children can play outside. If we want that life, we can get to it. The science is very clear about how to get there. The fight has begun. I went to countries from France to New Zealand that have begun to take on these forces, but we've got to decide to do it. We've got to decide that attention is a thing we value. And if we want it for us and our children, we've got to resolve to take it back. We're talking to Johan Hari, his newest book, Stolen Focus, Why You Can't Pay Attention and How to Think Deeply Again. You're also the author of a couple other books, Lost Connections, under, uh, Uncovering the Real Causes of Depression and Unexpected Solutions. Also, Chasing the Scream, the first and last days of the war on drugs. One of your TED Talks, Everything You Think You Know About Addiction is Wrong. I'm asking you a huge question right now, and I'm curious to see how you'll approach your answer. It may depend on the jurisdiction that we're talking about, but Canada is among the nations experiencing an opioid crisis right now. The different jurisdictions provincially uh, have different solutions or different approaches to it from uh, detox availability, harm reduction centers, including supervised consumption services. As you look at the human condition, as you look at addiction, in particular, the opioid crisis, what are we doing wrong right now? What's the wake up call that you think millions of people need to hear about? Well, I spent a lot of time in Canada for, for my book about addiction, Chasing the Scream, a lot of time on the downtown east side in Vancouver is one of the key parts of the book. And I spent a lot of time in different parts of Canada as well. Um, and this is a very personal uh topic for me one of my earliest memories is of trying to wake up one of my relatives and not being able to and I, I didn't understand why then because I was too young but as I got older I realized we had addiction in my family and still have addiction in my family and um I think to understand what we're doing wrong when it comes to addiction there's there's different aspects of drug policy but when we think about addiction I think it what transformed my thinking about this was understanding what causes addiction so if you'd asked me, you know, God, how long ago was it now? 12 years ago when I started researching this topic. If you'd said to me, Johan, what causes, let's say heroin addiction, because that's close to me, what causes heroin addiction? I would have looked at you like you're an idiot. And I would have said, well, Ryan, 
the clues in the name mm. obviously heroin causes heroin addiction right we've been told this story for a hundred years that's become totally part of our common sense it was certainly part of mine you know so we think if we kidnapped the next 20 people to walk past your studio in edmonton and we injected them all with heroin every day for a month like a villain in a saw movie at the end of that month they'd all be addicted to heroin for a simple reason that there's chemical hooks in heroin that after a month of exposure their bodies would start to desperately physically crave right that's why in english we call it being hooked right we think addiction is a, is synonymous with a huge tremendous physical hunger for the chemical hooks it turns out that story isn't wrong but it's a very small part of what's actually going on with addiction and the first thing that alerted me to the fact there's something not wrong with not not right about that story is when a great canadian um dr gabor Marte explained to me my friend explained to me in britain where i'm from um if, if i if at the end of this interview i stepped out into the street and i got hit by a truck and i broke my hip they take me to hospital and they give me a, a lot of a drug called diamorphine for the pain quite likely diamorphine is heroin right it's medically pure heroin it's much better than the stuff people are scoring on the streets in edmonton right mm -hmm. it's it's the good stuff um people in british hospitals are given medically pure heroin often for quite long periods of time anyone listening who has a british grandmother who's had a hip replacement operation your grandma's taken a lot of heroin mm -hmm. So if we what we think about addiction is right the narrative about addiction the narrative about the opioid crisis is right what should be happening to all these people in britain being given very powerful heroin in hospital when they leave they should be trying to score on the streets this has been studied very carefully it never happens and i remember when i learned that and i interviewed the scientists involved i just thought well that can't be true it, it makes no sense how could you have someone in a hospital bed being given loads of really powerful heroin they don't become addicted and you've got someone shooting up in the alleyway outside who does become addicted how could that be and i only began to understand it when i went to interview another great canadian extraordinary man named professor bruce alexander in vancouver who explained to me the story we have in our heads that addiction is caused primarily or entirely by exposure to the drug the chemical hooks in the drug comes from a series of experiments that were done earlier in the 20th century they're really simple experiments anyone listening you can try them at home if you're feeling a little bit sadistic you take a rat you put it in a cage and you give it two water bottles one is just water and the other is water laced with either heroin or cocaine if you do that the rat will almost always prefer the drug water and almost always kill itself within a couple of weeks so there you go that's our story right uh the rat tries the drug needs more and more chemical hooks eventually it kills itself but in the 70s professor alexander was working on the downtown east side and he became curious about these experiments and he looked at them and said what happened a minute they put the rat alone in an empty cage where it's got nothing that makes life meaningful for rats mm. all it's got is the drugs what would happen if we did this differently so he built a cage that he called rat park which is basically like heaven for rats they've got loads of friends they've got loads of cheese they can have loads of sex they've got loads of colored balls anything a rat likes and finds meaningful in life is there in rat park and they've got both the water bottles the normal water and the drug water and this is the fascinating thing in rat park they don't like the drug water they hardly ever use it none of them use it compulsively none of them overdose so you go from very heavy compulsive use and overdose when they don't have the things that make life worth living to no compulsive use and overdose when they do have the things that make life worth living now there's lots of human examples of this they're playing out all around you you mentioned Canada is having a horrific opioid crisis um it made me realize the opposite of addiction is not sobriety valuable though that is to many people the opposite of addiction is connection the, the core of addiction is about not wanting to be present in your life because your life is too painful a place to be once you understand that you can see why a lot of what we did for a long time which is punishing people with addiction problems doesn't uh, sometimes we say it doesn't work which is true it doesn't work it's worse than that it makes the problem worse if pain is the driver of addiction inflicting more pain on people makes the problem worse and um, so to look to solutions we have to look to the places that have actually built their policies 
around the insights that emerge from Rat Park. I can talk about that a bit if you like, but I'm conscious I've been giving you a very long answer there. No, I mean, we'll listen to you talk all day, to be honest with you. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I want to be respectful of your time. We're past how, no, long, how long we've asked to speak no, with no, you. I'm chill, yeah. I mean, we've, we've got people in our live chat right now, Johan. Most people hear this later on the podcast, but in our live chat, people are saying, this. I, I'm, they're getting tickets right now to the to the March oh. 15th brunch, which is awesome. Uh, the great news is, is that if you're in Edmonton, you can hear Johan Hari in person uh, coming up uh, two weeks from yesterday. It's March 15th. It's the annual fundraising breakfast for the Mental Health Foundation. You can get the details and buy your tickets at mentalhealthfoundation.ca. You can also make a, a donation, become a sponsor to the event, uh, support care for mental health and addictions. You can also join this breakfast virtually. Uh, and they'll actually, this is so cool, that they'll cater it. They're shipping breakfast out to people so they can watch from their, their workplaces, their offices, their own homes, which is great. It makes it uh, accessible and available to a whole bunch of people. Um, before you go, I would love to pick your brain on something. Um, I met sure. my son's hockey practice this weekend, and he wanted to stick around and watch the big guys play, the U19s. The under-19s had a game after. My son's there watching through the glass, and a couple of the parents of the the, the, the athletes were there, and, and one guy leans over to me, indicated that he's a fan of Real Talk. He's listening to the show. He had heard that you were going to be on the show, and this guy says you have to ask Johan for his take on the four-day work week. Now, some background with this guy. Uh, he owns a big landscape company and he said it just wouldn't work for us he said we, we make hay when the sun shines we work seven days a week in the summer you know it's just it's not the type of business uh you know for our employees it wouldn't work to to go to the four-day work week but he said as an executive leader and as the leader of that company he can't help but be intrigued by what he sees as more and more momentum uh moving toward that type of a of an employment structure obviously covid factors in fewer people are working in the workplace so to speak returning to the office office uh, uh, how much have you had to sort of blow up your own uh, preconceived notion of what the work week needs to look like or where do you see the trends going or what in particular is is captivating you uh, with regards to what the future of work looks like for the average person so this i can answer i'm glad you asked me something that i can talk about because i've done a huge amount of research on this for, for stolen focus so i was interested in researching this because there's a huge amount of evidence that exhaustion devastates attention and a huge amount of evidence that we are exhausted. I don't think anyone listening needs me to give them evidence for that, but if you want me to, believe me, I can. Um, and stress really harms your ability to focus and pay attention. So I was curious about, okay, four-day week seems to reduce that. So I spent a lot of time in New Zealand where the most advanced um, experiment in this had taken place. So there's a guy called Andrew Barnes, who is a really fascinating guy. You should, In fact, you should have him on. Remind me, I'll introduce him. I'm sure he'd love to talk about it. Um, so Andrew is a super successful businessman in the 80s. He's British, but he, he lives in New Zealand now. He's been there a long time. But so in the 80s, he worked for the British, the city of London, our equivalent to Wall Street. And so if you picture those pictures, you imagine those pictures from the 80s of like men in big shoulder padded suits yelling at each other across the stock market floor going, sell, sell, buy, buy. He was that guy, right? And in that world, you know, you were expected to be at work at 7 a.m. and you were expected to leave like earliest 7 p.m. So half the year, he never even saw the sun, right? He didn't have a good relationship with his wife. It broke down. He barely saw his children. And Andrew was smart enough to be like, this is just not the life for me. And he left and went to New Zealand, Australia and then New Zealand. Years later in 2017, he read a study, it was just a business magazine that really took him aback. He found that actually initially the study was from Canada it found that in Canada, the average worker is in their workplace, this is obviously pre-COVID, is in their workplace eight hours a day, but is actually only productively working for three hours a day. Wow. And it was like, wow, this is, that's bad, right? And he said, that's a lousy deal for them because their life is passing them by and they're not doing the stuff they want to do. Obviously, it's a lousy deal for the employer. And he said, I think this might be because my workers are exhausted and stressed out. And he suddenly asked himself, well, what if I gave everyone an extra day off, just pay them the same, but they move from a, a five-day week to a four-day week, and in return, they were less stressed, less exhausted, such that it meant that they worked 45 minutes more productively a day, mm. right? He said, if these figures are right, then it would pay for itself. So Andrew owns the company outright. It's a co company called Perpetual Guardian, big company that manages wills and trusts, all over us, uh, all over New Zealand. And I remember he 
So he has a company call, which is everyone who works for Petro Guardian is on the call. And he tells them, hey, everyone, good news. From now on, you've only got to work four days a week, but I'm going to pay you for five. His head of HR literally fell over. And everyone was like, has Andrew gone mad? Is there some trick here? And the transition took place over, it was over six months. They had a lot of time to plan it. And it was monitored by Auckland Business School. And I spent a lot of time in, I interviewed everyone who worked in their offices in a place called Road to Rua. And what was fascinating was, um, they achieved more in four days than they had in five, not per hour. Overall, they achieved more in four hours than they had in five. And this is something they've discovered almost everywhere where they've had four day week experiments from Microsoft in Japan to Nissan in Gothenburg in, to in uh, Sweden, that they achieve more in four days. I remember at first thinking that's too good to be true. <laughs> Just, I don't believe it. Right. I mean, I, I I'm skeptical of things I want to believe. Right. And then, one person explained it to me really well, a guy called Professor Jeffrey Pfeffer, who's at Stanford University, one of the leading experts in the world on uh, organizational management. And he said, ask any sports fan, right? Ask your hockey dad, right? Do you want your team to walk onto the pitch exhausted, having done 10 hours a day for the last seven days a week, you know, knackered, burned out and stressed? Of course not. You want your team to go onto the pitch well rested and up for the game. And you know that if they do that, they're way more likely to win. Well, he said, well, if that's true of your sports team, it's true of your colleagues. It's true of your workers, right? Stressed out, burned out, exhausted people do not produce, do not produce work at their best. And look, I have to admit to you, Ryan, this is something I really struggle with because the culture we grow up in, all of us, you know, if I have a day, like today, I'm doing like 10 interviews, right? <sighs> Which is far more than I should do. And I will go to bed and I will be exhausted. And there'll be a little Puritan bit of me that will go, good job, Johan. You, you, you've worked so hard today that you're completely exhausted. Yeah. Even though I know and have learned all this evidence, actually, that's not a very, I would do much better interviews if I did five interviews and not 10. And I'll be more, I would be much more productive tomorrow because I wouldn't be burned out. Um, so we've got to really deeply challenge our concept of productivity because the, the ways we work are ruining our attention. And if your attention is ruined, your work is going to be much worse than it otherwise would be. So the evidence from four day weeks, we've now got a huge amount of evidence from four day weeks. Um, and it's been pretty rigorously studied. So I don't know enough about landscaping to, I can understand there's obviously seasonal variations. It might be like, you know, a farmer's got to get the crop in a certain time and you can't say to the crop, Sorry, I'll be, I'm going to do four days and then I'll come back. Right. I understand that. There's, of course, some businesses where it's not applicable. But I would say the principles where uh, the less exhausted your workers are, the less stressed your workers are, the more hour by hour their work will improve. Now, I should also say, by the way, I've talked about this as a boss delivering it. And look, Andrew is a great, Andrew Barnes is a wonderful man. Most people will not be so lucky that their boss will hand this down. Most of us will be in a position where if we want that and we should want that. And by the way, even if it didn't make us more economically productive, I would be in favor of a four day week because life is not all about work. But if we want that, most people, I think, you know, should form labor unions and fight for it. And I think we'll, we'll get it if we fight for it. Just like the reason we have the weekend is because people before us, um, Canada was one of the first countries after Australia to do this. Uh, workers before us fought for the weekend. People used to work seven days a week and then they got it down to six and they got it down to five. And I think this is a necessary civilizing next step and it would definitely boost our attention and focus. You're speaking truth, my man, and I'm looking oh. forward. Uh, I'm looking forward to, to two weeks uh, coming up, March fifteenth. That's uh, Wednesday, two Wednesdays from now. The annual fundraising breakfast in support of the Mental Health Foundation. It's uh, proudly presented by our friends at Altitude Investments, and I know that everybody's really excited uh, to see and hear from you, Johan. People can get their tickets, learn more, to either attend in person in Alberta's capital city of Edmonton or attend virtually at MentalHealthFoundation.ca. You can learn uh, learn more about Johan's books, his TED talks and of course all of his other involvements by checking out johanharry.com the new book stolen focus why you can't pay attention and how to think deeply again can't thank you enough uh, we took oh. you into overtime and we really appreciate it 
Oh, I really enjoyed your questions. Cheers, Ryan. Thanks, Johan. Hope to see you when I'm in town. Yeah, you Thanks. got it. Looking forward to it. So impressed by Johan Hari. Really grateful he made the time to join us. Make sure you share that interview with anybody you think might benefit for learning more about our stolen focus. Hey, are you in on the chat GPT train? Have you been leveraging or utilizing this artificial intelligence to, to help you put a document together or maybe even write a presentation for work? Be honest. Did you get chat GPT to write the tribute speech for your son's wedding? I mean, people all over the world are using this new AI to help them create content. And that includes post-secondary students. Universities already on the lookout for plagiarism are going to have to be able to sniff this stuff out. And that's exactly what motivated Edward Tian, a Princeton student from Canada, to develop a new app. He tells us all about it in this episode of The Best of Real Talk. But first, a word from the sponsors who are making this possible. Are you a professional in engineer or a recent graduate from an engineering school anywhere in Canada, Apex Automation wants to talk to you. That's right. They're hiring in a number of rewarding career opportunities. We're talking engineering, fabrication, automation. This team is leading the charge, putting their people and their clients ahead of their profits. You want proof on why this company's culture is different than all the rest? Check them out today at apexautomation.ca. Tens of thousands of Canadians are trusting their post-secondary learning experience to Athabasca University. Why? Because Canada's Open University offers world-class accredited online programs and courses that give you the flexibility to learn at your own pace on a schedule that suits your lifestyle. Plus, it's one of Canada's most reputable research universities. You can learn more about the undergraduate, graduate programs, and other reasons to check out AthabascaU.ca. California Closets is providing custom closets and storage solutions for the entire home. Make the most of your space with their custom organizational systems. Sure, it may be a dream closet in your bedroom, or maybe it's a craft closet downstairs for the kids. How about something to house your entertainment system in a way that increases the quality of the experience and the value of your home? Plus, they do garages. Oh, do they do garages? You can get a free consultation today at californiaclosets.ca. Are you dealing with flood damage, fire damage? Maybe you or your construction crew found mold or asbestos in those walls you're looking to renovate. Oh man, this type of nightmare needs to be trusted to the talented team at Complete Care Restoration. They're the ones we trusted with our studio build. They're the ones you should trust for whatever you need done. Construction, renovation, or recovery. It's Complete Care Restoration online at completecarerestoration.ca. No matter what you're celebrating, guaranteed there's a perfect fit for a custom DQ cake. That's right, any occasion is a happy occasion with a DQ cake. We recommend that real talkers check out the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. You'll find happiness however you want it. That world famous soft serve with a fudgy crunchy chocolatey middle. The perfect way to celebrate any occasion is a DQ cake from the Dairy Queens in Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, West Mount at Baseline Road. For more than 20 years, Eden Landscaping has been bringing outdoor spaces to life. Still family owned, still based out of Edmonton, Alberta, this team has perfected the art of modern to traditional and then every other type of landscape design. Their projects all have one thing in common, that's happy clients. What's the difference in dealing with Eden Landscaping? Find out today with a free consultation. You can learn more and book it at landscapeedmonton.ca.
The first of the month means 15% off grocery purchases of $75 or more at all Friesen Brothers locations. 16 of them across the province of Alberta where Albertans have trusted this family-owned grocer to put quality, affordable, nutritious meals on those family dinner tables. Established in 1955, still family-owned. It's Friesen Brothers online at Friesen.com. Are you noticing health issues with your pets? Maybe obvious joint pain? Maybe there's something with their coat just doesn't look the same as it used to? It could be what they're eating. May we recommend you check out Grand Dog Essentials Quality Raw Food. We're proud to feed Grand Dog Essentials Quality Raw Food to our dogs, and we've seen the health benefits. The best part about it, it's affordable. The business is family owned. They care deeply about what they do. And the food's delivered right to our door. If you're in Edmonton, Calgary, or Central Alberta, check them out online. The promo code REALTALK takes 10% off your first order at granddog.ca. Are you an apprentice or journey person electrician? Kubi Renewable Energy would love to hear from you. That's right, it is heading into their hottest season, the busiest time of year, and they're looking for installers, looking to put up solar power projects across BC, Alberta, and into Saskatchewan. Kubi Energy is one of Canada's busiest solar installers and the only installer that's Tesla certified. You can check out the work that they're doing online at kubienergy.ca. Make the next move in your career today. If you're making decisions for a small business, a large business, or an entire community when it comes to residential or commercial, even industrial garbage and recycling management, maybe you're taking a look at a big home renovation or a huge landscaping project and you could use one of those front load or roll off bins. Are you putting together a community event or a festival this summer where you'll need fencing, portable toilets, or even water hauling? Keep it local with Local Environmental Services. You'll find them online at localenvironmental.ca. You may have seen this or not. You've no doubt heard about this this new AI, right? This chatbot, chat GPT, right? Basically, and we're going to get our our lead-off guest this morning, our our lead-off hitter to to explain this all to us, but basically it's it's AI that, that can compose prose it can put words together in some circumstances where let's say hypothetically a paper may be submitted for a university course to a professor and that professor is unable to determine if a real human or if the chat bot chat gpt wrote the paper obviously with new tech comes its trade-offs and there are positives but there are negatives as well and that's what edward tian's been working on he's a, a princeton university student and over the new year break he Well, he developed an app that can detect plagiarism using chat GPT. How cool is that? He calls it GPT Zero. Edward, kind enough to join us this morning, making his Real Talk debut. It's so nice to see your face. Happy New Year to you, and thanks for making time for us. Thanks so much, Ryan. Happy New Year as well, and it's great to be on the show. Uh, Obviously, uh, you have a a real command of this tech, and I think the implications, and I'm looking forward to picking your brain on it, but for for those of us that might not be 100% able to articulate exactly what chat GPT is, can can you bring us up to speed in layperson's terms? Absolutely. So chat GPT is a really exciting new technology. You can think of these large machine models that are being built as they're ingesting huge portions of the internet, like hundreds and hundreds of terabytes of text. And they're looking through these texts for patterns. And they're using these patterns to uh, help inform this AI on how to generate text. Um, And this technology is so incredibly new and exciting, but it also feels like it's been suddenly thrust upon the world, that ChatGPT is suddenly ready for commercialization and a lot of people are still wrapping their head around the implications because with every new technology we need to be adopting these technologies responsibly um and and so we're, we're still grappling with that yeah the world is still grappling with that. and i think you've nailed it with the advent of something new especially when it roars in quickly people 
kind of get caught on their heels. Collectively, we do. And we go, whoa, 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 we're, we're not necessarily familiar with this. And what does this mean? And, and what are the implications? But but the one word you just used really jumps out at me, and that's exciting. So you're not here to say that this technology, this AI is inherently bad. Not No, not at all. In fact, a lot of people have thought that, you know, GPT-0 is going against chat GPT. That's really not the case. I think AI is the future. AI is definitely here to stay. This chat GPT technology is only going to get better and better. So it's really not about, um, you know, banning this technology or fighting against this technology. It's about how we can adopt it responsibly and have the safeguards. So we're not entering this new AI future blindly. So can, can you give us some examples of how you can see this tech of, of chat GPT being applied in a really positive, beneficial way? How might people see it implemented in the next, you know, one to 24 months? Yeah. So I actually use a version of chat GPT that's um, pretty much the same technology for code generation. And I actually use it to help me write code myself. So it's it's almost ironic that I was building GPT-0 the the app that detects chat gpt involvement with with some technologies that that are are sort of with the chat gpt involvement technology a little bit of an irony there that someone pointed out but yeah there's there's potential for it to really get people started on on things like uh writing code or or just starting you know an essay and getting ideas uh, and and also searching for answers as well that it does really well with asking it just like questions you might Google, but now you can ask ChatGPT. Okay, this is a really elementary level question, but but yeah. with, with AI constantly encountering problems and, and, and solving them, that's my basic understanding of how AI works. Uh, wouldn't wouldn't ChatGPT detect that it was being used by you to, to defeat itself or, or to recognize its own detection and therefore through a uh, self-preservation mode interfere with your attempt to use chat gpt to develop your app gpt zero how does how does ai play into that well wow, I'm, I'm wrapping my brain all around all around that uh, <laughs> I'm, no kidding so uh it, it's 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 pretty simple here the uh, so chat gpt and all of these gpt technology can get you started but they can't do the work for you um so you really still need to uh, build the app or code it. You really still need to, you know, write your essays. They're not coming up with new ideas. What really ChatGPT or a lot of these AI models do is that they're regurgitating patterns they've already seen uh, in, in in writing that's on the internet or work that's already on the internet. And nothing is really original that uh, is coming out of what ChatGPT is writing. Okay, so so what what uh, it's not like it's going to cure cancer or something like that. It's it's not going to no. develop the next theory of relativity. Uh, no. you're, so you're sitting here over my understanding over your holiday break. Like it sounds to me yeah. like you used your New Year's break at Princeton uh, to write code and develop this new app GPT Zero. Was it was it prompted? I mean, I, I teed it up as though it was prompted to combat plagiarism. Was that the driving force, or is that just maybe one of the applications? That was absolutely, that was the initial application just because we've heard so much recent, you know, buzz about this was just really thrust upon the world and teachers and educators are still wrapping their heads around how are they going to, you know, work with chat GPT, uh, like being accessible to everybody and they're still wrapping their head. Uh, and yeah, the, the big picture is like everybody deserves to know the truth on whether something is human involved or AI involved. So the big picture is, I don't think it's just two teachers versus students using GPT zero or these technologies. It's everybody because everybody wants to know and deserves to know. Are you getting the stink eye from fellow students? Yeah. So initially there was a lot of like buzz on, the, oh, wow. So, um, you know, it's being a narc or, or not, not really, you know, like why, why are you ruining a good thing? But really, I, I'm not thinking about it like that at all. I'm not opposed to students using AI when it makes sense. In fact, I think it's a future. I use like, you know, chat GPT or generation technology to build the app in, in my own coding process. I think it's a future, <laughs> but we absolutely need to enter this future responsibly. And it's it's like 
the solution is not to, you know, ban chat GPT from schools. The solution is to know like when it is used. So teachers can also address it responsibly. Can you, is it possible for you to explain to us how your app works? If, yeah. if we don't understand how apps work, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, totally. Like, like I'm a, re I'm a the, real pleb. You want yeah. the quick explanation? Yeah. The, the one that, you know, all of us can understand, not your Princeton okay. colleagues. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Totally. Um, so it's a GPT zero uses two things, perplexity and burstiness. You can think of perplexity as putting a text under a microscope and using data from the chat GPT model itself to see if it likes the text or not, if it's like familiar with the text or not. Um, and if it is really familiar with the text, if it's seen it in its own like training data set, then it's more likely to be machine generated. You can think of uh, the second variable, bur sorry, the second variable burstiness as the big picture. If we're looking at um, the text over time or the perplexity over time, humans will have like their perplexity over time vary all over the place. They'll go up and down versus a machine, uh, a machine text will be more, you know, constant over time. It'll be more boring. It'll be, it'll be like, it looks like a baseline. Ah. Um, so, so there's, there's that the two, two, it's like a microscope indicator and a big picture indicator. Very cool stuff. Um, first of all, can I, let me, let me just compliment you, by the way. Um, it, it's two different skill sets uh, to, to have the wherewithal and the ability and the, the, the insight and, and, and really the talent uh, that you have to develop tech like this. Uh, but also to be able to explain it to people uh, is a whole different skill set. And uh, what a great ambassador you are for this. Um, let me ask you in closing, uh, I, I don't know if you ever listened to the podcast Smartless. Uh, it's one of my absolute favorites. And they had filmmaker James Cameron on a short time ago. And uh, James Cameron was talking about AI and some of the interesting work, in particular CGI and filmmaking and things like that. But, but, but he's got some experience in the field. And he talked about, you know, whether or not he was nervous about how AI might factor into humans' future. And, and the conversation did get a bit whimsical, I'll acknowledge. Right. But he suggested that if AI were to take over the world, potentially, it could already be happening. And the brilliance of the AI would be that it would not be letting us know that the plan is already underway. Now, there's an element of ridiculousness to this, but also maybe not totally. Uh, you sound pretty excited, optimistic about the future of AI. I'm fascinated by it at a very entry level of understanding. Do you have concerns about AI? And if so, in closing, how would you recommend that the average human being approach their thinking around what's becoming such a pervasive and prevalent technology? Um, so no kidding, Ray. I have concerns about um, about these new technologies being developed uh, responsibly. So that that's that was the initial motivation of building GPT Zero over you know basically a few sittings at my uh, lo local Second Cup in Toronto, um, and 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 sort of like building this out for the world to use. Sort of the the concerns is that one is when people are putting machine writing as their own work. That's a concern. That's the most immediate concern. But a big picture concern and down the line into the future is that all of these AI and text generation technologies, they're not coming up with original thoughts. So imagine a world 10, 20 years down the line where everybody is writing their essays with chat GPT then all of these essays are going to be exactly the same and they're going to look exactly the same. And no one is com coming up with beautiful, original compositions. And I think that's sad because there's something in the human language that computers can really never co-opt and should never be able to co-opt. Um, and that's worth preserving. So down the line, being able to write is still going to be an important skill. I love it. You can follow Edward Tian on, on Twitter at Edward underscore the six. Nice little Toronto shout out there. And uh, hey, man, it's been such a pleasure. We love talking to people that are smarter than us uh, because it elevates our dialogue. <laughs> Congratulations on that new app. And thanks for making time for us.
Thanks, Ryan. And feel free to try out the app yourself. Yeah, I you sure will. Me. 100%. I bet you a lot of people will after hearing this. Thanks, Edward. Talk about a smart guy. Love that stuff. We'll continue to bring you the stories as we stay on top of technological developments and everything else. AI, of course, factoring more into our everyday life than we even realize, to say the least. Thanks for joining us on this episode of The Best of Real Talk. We hope you'll join us again tomorrow when we reintroduce you to The Bold Ones, author Sean Canungo and The Wheelie Peeps, stars of a new doc on CBC. Real Talk is hosted by Ryan Jesperson, executive producer Josh Dunford, Technical producer, John Hicks. General manager, Katie Cook Chivers. Account coordinator, Lawrence Durlego. Human resources, Lena Shepard. Website design, Mike Johnston. Voiceover by me, Carrie Skelton. Real Talk's editorial board is Sapria Duvetti, Ahmed Ali, Brandy Morin, Ann Castleman, Corey Hogan, Harmon Candola, Catherine O'Neill, and Chris Henderson. Member Emerita, Julie Rohr. Real Talk is recorded in Edmonton, Alberta on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional and ancestral territory of the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, Soto, and Nakota Sioux, home to the Métis settlements and the Métis Nation of Alberta. Real Talk is a relay project. For more, check out ryanjasperson.com.